Welcome back to our discussion with Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chastney, as we look back at the year 2019. Infrastructure, Prime Minister, and I see you already give that smile because, uh, again, referring to the Article 4 consultation for St. Lucia, I said that the projects that the government has in the pipelines, capital projects, certainly it would be a great jump start for uh, the economy. The expectation is that it is going to substantially boost growth between 2020 and 2022. So the focus for your government in the last um, financial year, the rehabilitation of the Millennium Highway and the West Coast Road, there's a reconstruction uh, or, or rehabilitation of secondary roads and uh, collector roads, feeder roads, and um, the redevelopment and expansion of the Hironora International Airport. We know that deserves a little special attention, so we're going to give it its due. But the rehabilitation for the Millennium Highway, uh, that is, I think a lot of people are in great anticipation because it's really, it has become a great sort of connecting road uh, between um, Castries and the southern part of the island. Where are we at with that? Because some people want to be able to see that the tractors are going out and doing things, you know, with immediacy. Is it happening? Yeah, um, so the, the monies or the funding for that project is coming from the DFID fund. So when um, David Cameron was prime minister, he committed something like 330 million pounds to CARICOM, of which St. Lucia's portion was somewhere between 30 and 40 million pounds. Um, the former government had allocated that money towards the uh, um, North-South Highway. Uh, we just felt that that was not even going to be sufficient and the time um, to spend that money would not have been able to, we would not have been able to fulfill it. We felt that the Millennium Highway and we felt the West Coast Road in particular were in dire need of reinforcement. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we've allocated the money. So the project is managed by CDB. and has to go through, uh, first of all, a, a test, which it passed um, to being qualified. Then it uh, had to get a, a bidding process to find a designer. So that was done last year. The designer came on board. The designer um, has completed the designs now um, of the project. We've gotten them to agree to break the project into three parts, the Millennium Highway and Ancillary being the first part. I'm uh, sorry, the Ancillary Bridge being the first part. Uh, and the uh, board of CDB is meeting or has met and hopefully approved um, the next phase, which would be now putting it out to bid. Uh, so once it goes out to bid, um, that takes about anywhere between two and three months, depending on how everything goes. Uh, so work should be commencing in March or April of this year on that project. And the Millennium Highway, which I call the roller coaster, because mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'm surprised more people have not had accidents on that road. So we're very excited that that's going to take place. Uh, following on the heels of that was the uh, shock bridge, the, sorry, the cul-de-sac bridge, which is being done by JICA, the Japanese. Uh, sadly, you know, that was a project that was supposed to start much earlier. Um, when it was put out to bid, uh, the contractors did not come up with the prices that everybody had thought that they would have. And so it had to go back out to bid again, and this time reduce the, the project to just being the, um, the, the bridge itself. Uh, my understanding is that a Japanese company has been identified they have visited here and we're hoping to hear that, that the Japanese government has approved now for that project to be able to, to commence. So that project has been scaled down? The Ravin Poisson portion of it has been taken out and we're looking for other resources to do that bridge because that's such a critical bridge that we have to be able to do. Um, so I'm very excited about getting that road done. In, in addition to the Millennium Highway and the Ancillary Bridge, uh, will also be laybys. Uh, there's a huge component of, of strengthening of for, for resilience, so slope stabilization, safety in terms of barriers, um, all along the height of the, the road going down to Sioux Fair. And you know, that's obviously a very important road for us mm -hmm. um, from a tourism perspective and then also for the livelihood of the people who live in Ancillary and, and canneries and also in Sioux Fair. All right, so the reconstruction for our secondary roads, the collector roads, uh, 
we now have what is deemed to be the largest ever in the history of St. Lucia for road rehabilitation and funded by the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, some $42 million, if, if memory serves me correct. Uh, portions of that program, I think, have sort of unfolded in the pockets, areas of communities. When can we expect to see a really large scale of the, the project unfolding? So it's already started. Um, Kasimba Road um, has been done. Um, the uh, uh, Forest Air Road has been completed. Um, and some other roads in um, Babino have been done. Uh, we're Piat, um, Saltabus Road. Um, the Piat is hopefully going to start just now. Uh, there are a lot of roads, back roads in the Groselet and Castries North constituencies. Um, so there are roads all throughout St. Lucia, the length and breadth of St. Lucia. In my own constituency, the Blasha Road and the Spring Road, the Denry um, Town Roads. Uh, there's roads in, in Miku North that are going to be done. So all throughout the length and breadth of this country, um, they're going to be started. So we have been, uh, had agreed with the Taiwanese to borrow approximately um, uh, 250 million US dollars. 100, 100 million dollars went towards the, the airport. Uh, 8 million went, 4 million went to um, housing, 4 million US went to the Ministry of Education, and 40, 42 million is going into, into the road redevelopment. Uh, because of the loan and the structure of the loan, we have a five year moratorium. So we actually will be doing an, an additional um, 10 or 12 million US dollars work of roads primarily in the Groselet and also um, Castries area. Uh, so all those road works are starting right now. Uh, the designs have been completed, contract, I mean, uh, contract, subcontractors have been identified. My understanding is all they're doing is finalizing the negotiation between OECC and themselves um, to be able to proceed with, the, with that work program. Uh, in addition to that, we're doing the West Coast Road as well as the uh, Millennium Highway, uh, the bridges that we're going to be doing, and then we're also doing feeder roads. So we have about 50 million EC dollars in helping uh, rebuild and, um, and re-strengthen and, and re redevelop feeder roads. So uh, for my, our farmers, this is critical. And with the emphasis that we're doing on bananas, as well as in the uh, diversification programs, very, very, very important. And, and sadly, in all of these things, we're not getting to do everything that we need to do. So, you know, in terms of feeder roads, there should be about $80 million or more of work to be done. Uh, the roads that we're doing with the, uh, the Taiwanese only represents one third of the total roads in St. Lucia. Uh, so, but this is a beginning. Uh, it's going to be a significant impact on St. Lucia. And I have to say to everybody that this does not include any new roads. <laughs> this is just rehabilitating the existing what is roads. Already there. And that's why I'm saying is that the deterioration of the infrastructure of this country was just going unabated. Not enough money was being spent over the years on maintaining the existing roads. And even after a period of time, even if you're maintaining a road, you're going to have to rehabilitate it. Um, the other big project I'm sure you're going to bring up is uh, the North South Highway. Yes. Critical, critical road. Um, so there was a feasibility that was done by CDB. We are in discussions with the Americans, the Canadians, and with the Taiwanese um, to look at the final, putting in a final design for, those, for that road and coming up with a final costing. But preliminary costs are around 300 million US dollars to be able to develop that road. Uh, we have set aside $28 off of the airport tax um, in order to be able to fund that road. So as soon as we have been able to finalize everything, we will assign $28 to be able to do that. Once we've completed the airport, and we think that if we see an increase in arrivals in excess of 500,000, that we can actually pay off the loan uh, for the airport quicker, and then now assign that money to be able to help us to complete that highway. But I, I wanna say that, that probably it is one of the most significant infrastructure projects that we would have to take. This is the one project that really takes St. Lucia to the next level. So when you go to Barbados as an example, think of Barbados without the ABC Highway. 
And that's exactly where we are. And those people who are traveling between Castries and Groselet know exactly what I'm talking about. How much of the traffic that wants to go up north doesn't need to come through Castries? How much of the land on the east coast that we can't access because there's not a proper road there? Uh, so if in fact now you have the container port in cul-de-sac, you now have a proper Millennium Highway that's going to continue to Denry with a tunnel through to Bartlehill, and then you have two industrial highways that are going north and south at that point, that even the distribution of cargo and uh, in, uh, commercial traffic now can go on that major highway. And I think it's going to make a significant difference um, in the growth potential of solution. All right. You're giving yourself a timeline in, within which this should be completed? We would like, we would like um, uh, before our term completed this time, to have secured the financing and finalized the designing. If, in fact, we could start, that would be a bonus. Um, but right now, uh, given um, the constraints we have, because we don't have an, a limitless supply of monies, Right. We were able to create some space for ourselves by introducing the airport tax and by putting in the gas tax. Um, so that therefore these claims and allegations that the country is um, rudderless and that we have problems financially is not true. We are seeing an improvement in tax collections, which are continuing to pay the recurrent, and, uh, recurrent expenditure. Okay. But these new projects that we're bringing in have their own dedicated revenue streams. And certainly every major project that we're bringing in, we're trying to have some form of dedicated revenue stream. And so the goal is not to burden the taxpayer nor increase the national well, the debt tax, burden. The taxpayer is paying, right? Because whether it's through a gas tax, um, whether it's through an airport tax, I mean, the, the majority of the airport tax is being paid for by the, by the tourists and all these things help now improve our overall, our, our, our tourism product. But there are people who but travel. But not to burden them by having to take loans. Correct. So the government having to well, take it's loans. Not, it's, it's, not to so. bur it's not to burden the state um, in the sense that we are running deficits. So uh, the, 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 the most worrisome number that solutions should have been aware of under the previous government regime was the fact that we were spending 170 million EC dollars a year on interest. In 2003, that number was 33 million. Right? That's a lot of money to be paying in interest. And so we need to be mindful of that. And what we've been able to do is not allow that number to grow. We've been able to do that by uh, reducing the amount of short-term uh, treasury bills we have, by not borrowing as much money as we had before um, that's going to have to come out of the recurrent expense. So all that $170 million is coming out of recurrent expenditure. So the interest and the principal on these new loans are being paid for by these dedicated taxes. The redevelopment of the Huronor International Airport, we did have an announcement uh, in the midway through 2019 that the you know, sort of first phase was beginning uh, with that project. Some people would believe that false start. Um, not really. I mean, you and I had this discussion um, a while back. When a project begins is not when you see the ground breaking uh, taking place. There are so many things that have to go on behind the scenes. So this is a very big project. Um, a tremendous amount of soil testing, uh, EIAs, uh, designs, all had to be done. And in the midst of it, We've been in negotiation with the United States government to be able to have what we call a pre-clearance facility. So it means that U.S. passengers um, leaving St. Lucia would actually clear U.S. customs and immigration here. And so there had to be adjustments in the design that we were going to be able to make. Uh, we have been in negotiations with the Taiwanese, the OECC, um, in terms of finalizing the, the loan. We had to organize the other forms of the loan. So the $100 million from the Taiwanese was not going to complete the project. But the loan that we got from the Taiwanese with the five-year moratorium gives us the ability to borrow additional money, which we did. So we borrowed $75 million from a consortium of banks. We've been to Parliament twice with that particular bill, and we're now just finalizing that term agreement. So we can't start the heavy work until all of the loan agreements have been passed. My understanding is, is the final approvals are going to the uh, 
uh, Slasper board on Friday. But meanwhile, all the plans have been completed. The preliminary uh, master plan has been approved by planning. The infrastructure for the, uh, the foundation, which is going to require almost 2,000 piles because the, the soil is very soft there, all that has been completed. And my, my understanding is that they're very far advanced with their um, negotiations with the subcontractors in terms of allowing that project to proceed. So we're expecting very shortly what people are expecting to see, which is the physical part of it, would have happened. But we've been collecting the money. Um, a lot of laws have had to be changed. A lot of things had to be done in order to be able to accommodate this project. But I'm very excited as to the progress we've made. It's a very difficult project. And I really want to commend SLASPA. And I want to again thank the government of Taiwan um, for uh, extending their hand and providing us with this concessional loan. Wonderful. Now, as we are beginning to wrap up our discussion, Prime Minister, the unemployment rate, and of course that will fall in line with all of those pending projects that we have because people have anticipation of, of jobs. We're now seeing that there's a fall from 25% to 17%. Uh, the youth unemployment is also down uh, 10%. So we are from the 44%, we're now at 34%. And I do hear you say, not necessarily comforting. Yeah, I, again, these are all things that tell us that we're moving in the right direction. Uh, when you have even 17% of your population unemployed, that's distressing, you know, but relative to where we came from, it's, it's, an, it's a substantial improvement. And those numbers were numbers that we got in September. So I have to imagine that we should be getting the next quarter numbers. I, I genuinely believe that those numbers are going to come down. And certainly with um, the major projects starting, I think that our promise of getting to 15% in our first term, that we're actually going to beat that, that number um, and beat it quite significantly. Uh, so unemployment is an, is an important measure. Uh, and as we see more people becoming employed, and more people have money in their pockets, and people start spending that money like we saw over the Christmas period, then it becomes uh, uh, effective, meaning that more and more people now will start being employed, and uh, businesses hopefully continue to be confident uh, moving forward. Before we get to your expectations for 2020, I want to give you some time to talk about your tenure as the chairman of the Caribbean Community CARICOM, which has come to an end because we now have Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados, who has now assumed the chairmanship. Your uh, experience, detail that for us, if you can, or encapsulate for us what that experience was like at a critical time because we did have uh, the heads of government conference here. Um, lots of issues were on the table, very pressing issues, climate change being one of the, the primary things, as well as getting the CARICOM as an organization to function in such a way uh, that it is more meaningful and delivers more meaningfully to CARICOM nationals. Um, so, look, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity of being chairman. Uh, as I said to you, uh, the chairmanship really means that you're the, watch, the night watchman. Um, because there's not really a lot that you're going to be able to accomplish in six months. So it's whatever the critical issues that, that come up, it's your turn to be on night watchman. So you're the first uh, line of response to any of these issues. So the situation in Haiti, we had a very um, tense situation in Guyana um, that we were working through. Uh, we had uh, elections in Dominica, um, which required the um, RSS forces to be able to go in and be able to help. Uh, and then the continual work program that we have, the blacklisting with, the, um, with uh, some of the countries, uh, the climate change, as you indicated, was a real, a real topic. Um, CSME, because that was a hot topic of discussion um, when, when we were here, uh, the improvements of a regional security system. Mm -hmm. So uh, lots of things to be able to keep your, your, your pulse on. And correspondent banking. Correspondent, Critical. yeah, we had a we had a very important meeting in in uh, Washington D.C. I want to thank Prime Minister Gaston Brown, um, who leads that that segment. Uh, we I had also the opportunity of meeting with um, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, uh, late in the year. I also had the opportunity of meeting Prime Minister Boris Johnson very late in the year, and on both cases, using the opportunity to push forward 
um, the CARICOM initiative. I know that we've been trying for some time to be able to get Prime Minister Trudeau to come to a CARICOM heads of government meeting. I'm really hopeful that he will come to the meeting in Barbados um, in, in, in February. So I just want to say that, you know, with CARICOM, it, it doesn't stop. There's a continual agenda that we have to be able to follow. My government's position on regional organizations is they must achieve at least uh, one of two things, if not both. Uh, one is to improve the quality of governance in our country. So it means that the quality of my health care, the quality of my education system, the quality of my security system ought to be enhanced by regional participation. Um, secondly, that the cost of governance should come down. So by sharing some of these things, that the cost for me should come down. But ideally what you want is both. You want to see a, a reduction in costs and an improvement in the overall quality. And I'm not so sure we're always getting that. And I think that uh, honestly that, uh, and a lot of people have said this, I'm not the first, that, that, that CARICOM is in, in need of some structural reform itself. Uh, sadly, um, I was not able to make it to Guyana to meet with the staff and to be able to interact with them. Um, I was not able to spend any time looking at those structures uh, because we were overwhelmed with both si situations in St. Lucia and also other issues within CARICOM, Haiti being a very big one. Again, you know, very early we were supposed to have a trip to, to Haiti. Unfortunately, things got much worse. Um, they've seemed to have settled down a little bit, but that continues to remain um, a hot topic for, for, for us to be able to discuss. Although it's far from the public mind. But as we say hello to 2020, Mr. Prime Minister, in our remaining moments, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your own expectations for yourself, you, the government, and where you see St. Lucia going within this uh, new year. Well, we have 18 months left um, uh, uh, before elections. Um, I'm excited um, at the prospects because we've put a lot of hard work in. I'm expecting that uh, a lot of the, 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 the results of that hard work will become visible this year, both from an infrastructural perspective, because people will actually physically see work taking place, um, from a policy perspective, our Headquarters Act, um, the work that we're doing with the Europeans in terms of uh, making our financial sector secure, uh, that ought to be coming into fruition. I, th I think that we're going to continue to see our tourism grow. I'm very excited about uh, the prospects of, of coming with a major project with the cruise industry, particularly for Castries redevelopment, as well as putting a port in Viewfort. I think a, a, a cruise ship port in Viewfort and a home port in particular are gonna, is going to transform the south, not just Viewfort, but all the way to Sioux Fair and up to Denry. Uh, I'm excited about the work that's taking place in agriculture. Uh, I'm very excited about the work that's taking place in education. Uh, I'm, I'm very pumped about the new um, recording studio and a uh, broadcasting unit that's going to be put at the old um, St. Lucia radio, radio St. station Lucia and to be integrated into Sir Arthur Lewis. We've put a lot of work into thinking what we're going to do at Sir Arthur Lewis. Um, so the new uh, principal uh, and where he comes from and what he's doing is exciting. Uh, so there's a lot I'm looking forward to, uh, but it means that we just need to remain extremely focused. Very easy for people, because it's 18 months, to start thinking about elections. So my attitude is, is that we're keeping our foot on the accelerator uh, very hard this year. And really, I'd like to get to a point where m maybe we can get into fixed dates for elections, um, as well as um, spending less on elections. I mean, I see some countries, our neighbor in the North America, seems to be in perpetual election mode and the amount of money they spend. Whereas when I, was, I saw the Canadian elections, you wouldn't even know it, it came and went. Um, uh, I think England also has a very good system in terms of restriction, how much advertising and everything else that can be done, and a lot more controls. So I think it's important that um, people exercise their democratic rights, but I think as a small country, the amount of time that is attributed to it, we have to be very, we have to be very cautious. Uh, I have ignored um, my party um, politically in many ways. Um, you know, when I was in opposition, it afforded me the opportunity to spend substantial more time in my constituency branches 
and dealing with the party. And, and you know, you have a chairman of a party and you have a political leader of a party and it really is to continue to allow that to be nurtured. So I think that now that we've been able to accomplish what we have from a government and it really required my full-time attention, uh, my family um, and my political party, both I believe have suffered from the amount of time that I've had to focus um, on turning this thing around with, 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 with uh, the country. I'm not so sure I could ever describe to people um, what we were confronted and how difficult it has been to achieve what we had to achieve. Uh, the meetings with the World Bank and the IMF to build up their level of confidence, to be able to attract investors. I mean, this year, huge task ahead. We have $700 million of bonds that come due that we have to roll over. And so it's about keeping the confidence of those people, letting them understand and hopefully appreciate that we're on the right track. So again, in the sake of politics sometimes, when we are prepared to demean the brand in the name of St. Lucia, in the name of politics, we sometimes forget how much damage that we're doing. But unfortunately, that's not just unique to St. Lucia. That's unique everywhere. And so as a government, we have to continuously put ourselves in a position to be able to overcome that and let people know that there are uh, things that are taking place that are very positive, um, that we are a country that follows the rule of law, and that we believe that the strategy we have is a very effective one. So that's why when you hear about the reduction in unemployment, what's happening to the debt to GDP, um, what's happening with some of the, uh, the other projects, these are important milestones in terms of continuing to build and keep people's confidence. But I don't want solutions ever to believe for one minute that we as a government believe that that's what the final uh, road is going to be. Not until all solutions, and I do mean all solutions, um, are taken care of in this country and are living what we consider to be a decent, a decent living, um, will we ever stop. And it may not happen and be completed by the time my term of office completes, but I'm hoping that like many of the other leaders before me, particularly Sir John, um, that I would have made a, contri a significant contribution towards uh, achieving that. And solutions would be well on their way to living the best life ever. Thank you so much, Prime Minister, the Honorable Alan Chastney. We know it has been a very busy time for you, for taking the, the time of the schedule to be able to sit with us and give us a, a further insight into what it is the government of St. Lucia has been doing in the last year. But that brings us to the end of our special production, the Year in Review for 2019. I've been your host, Mr. Joseph. See you next time.